for daughter-in-law. That's from Lashni. Right, you're listening to your award-winning breakfast show. We're coming to you throughout South Africa. We're worldwide on www.lotusfm.co.za. You can catch us on the audio bouquet on DSTV on channel 808. Oh, there I even say it. Omicron has now been detected in at least 24 countries around the world after being identified by South African scientists last week. The World Health Organization has categorized it as a variant of concern and says early evidence suggests it has a higher reinfection risk. So while experts are not seeing any red flags on whether it will cause more severe disease, hospital data from Gauteng is showing that the bulk of hospital admissions, which is 87% are unvaccinated people, only 36% of South African adults have so far been fully vaccinated. And earlier this week, countries around the world restricted travel from southern Africa as details of the spread emerged, which was then rapidly connected as being discriminatory and unfair. In fact, the president yesterday used the word apartheid, uh, strangely enough, Ooh. and uh, some might look at that in terms of the way we've been read, listed, and as quickly as it's happened. Uh, it's further being speculated that Omicron first emerged in the Netherlands now and other countries before it was discovered in South Africa. But speculations aside, let's get the facts now, and we'll say a warm hello to a very busy man, SA's leading epidemiologist, Professor Salim Abdul Karim. Good morning. Very good morning to you, Neil. It's great to be back. Right. Good, good to have you back. Uh, Professor, when we spoke to you a few weeks ago, you said, and you, you had a few disclaimers, but you spoke to the fact that you're possibly going to see this fourth wave in December, and you spoke if there are mutations or variants, then, you know, it will be a full-blown fourth wave. What is your mirror ball saying today? Well... Uh, it's uh, it's interesting that uh, you pointed out because several people have been sending me messages yesterday to say, you know, you said in September that the fourth wave is going to start on the 2nd of December. And I said, well, you know, it's just pure luck. So when, you, uh, when we look at the way in which this virus is spreading, we can go very much on the basis that we will see an additional wave after about three months since the previous wave. Now, whether that new wave is going to be severe uh, or whether it's going to be just a small wave is determined by whether there's a variant. And here we have now, in our fourth wave, we have a new variant, which means we have to be ready to have a very severe fourth wave. Now, in this particular wave, because Omicron has mutations that are, uh, those same mutations are also present in all four of the variants of concern. So it has mutations that are in alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. And so it's got characteristics of all four of them. So for example, it's got delta's ability to spread fast. In fact, it's probably spreading even faster than Delta, though we can't tell for sure yet. It also has Beta's ability to escape immunity. And we know that when we had the Beta variant, that past infection provided no protection at all. So we are already seeing that now, that reinfection is pretty commonplace. So if you had past infection with COVID-19, it provides almost no protection against Omicron. And we will start seeing, in all likelihood, an increasing number of infections, breakthrough infections in vaccinated people. Fortunately, it looks like the vaccines do pretty well in preventing severe disease. They prevent hospitalization, severe disease, and death. So even if you do get infected and vaccinated, you will generally have a mild infection. So that's the good side of the importance of vaccines. In fact, this is a wake-up call. Go and get vaccinated because that's your best protection. All right. So that, that's a good point you make there, Professor. Now, the, of course, uh, as far as 
they uh, giving daily interviews on on Omicron and the latest observations from what we heard. There's just a few things happening that may be confusing people as we're consuming the information. There's a talk about the percentages we mentioned earlier that 87% of people at uh, hospital admissions now unvaccinated people. Has, has there anything that you have in front of you that you can attest to those numbers? No, I have been uh, talking to the uh, head of Maza, Sama, the medical association, and I've been getting information and feedback from the ground, from the clinicians at the front lines. And essentially what they've been telling me uh, is that the patients that they are seeing, and they're rapidly increasing, are generally younger, and they are mild and mostly presenting similarly to what we have seen before. So that's, you know, reassuring, but one has to take that, you know, with a lot of circumspection because you can't make too much of a situation uh, and looking at clinical presentation very early on because the severe cases normally take two to three weeks after infection before they present. So we don't know whether we're going to see a deluge of hospital patients, severe cases coming down the line. For now, it looks reasonable, but I wouldn't make too much of it. Right. It's interesting that you make that point uh, as further to what we've been hearing. You've always maintained this, though, uh, from all the various interviews we've had about people who've been vaccinated. You've always said that there's a lower risk of them being hospitalized and possibly uh, a lower fatality rate. Is, is it something you can still tick or, uh, once again, it's, it's, it's a bit circumspect? So when we, uh, you know, we don't know for sure yet, of course, because we've only known about the variants for about a week. But when we look at the way in which vaccines have protected against all the other variants, they have done very well in preventing hospitalization and severe disease. And, you know, when you get COVID, that's the main thing. You don't want to end up in the hospital. You want to be getting some kind of mild condition at most. And the vaccines are doing that. And they've done so very consistently against the past variants. And so there's no reason to believe that they wouldn't do the same with the current Omicron variant. What about the talk around initially what we heard was the, the vaccines that we've taken and how it would respond to this variant, which, you know, has various mutations. Uh, you know, once again, I know it's, it's almost an early stage to actually ink what you're going to say, but speculatively, uh, do, do we have any reason to believe that the, the efficacy of these vaccines will be compromised or we would see a drastic drop in them? Yeah, so when both the Delta variant and the Beta variant have mutations in them that change the way the virus attaches to the human cell. Now, on your, your cells that are in your nose and the back of your throat, the virus goes and attaches to those cells in a very specific part of that cell called... ACE2. Now, it's, it's a long name. I won't give you the full name, but basically, if you just take ACE2, so the way the virus attaches to ACE2 determines how easy it is to attach, cause infection, be infectious, and the way in which antibodies can displace it and block the virus from attaching to ACE2 because that's what the antibodies have to do. Now, what we have been finding is that beta and delta have ways in which they reduce the ability of antibodies to attach to the virus. Now, we would expect Omicron to do the same, that it would reduce the ability of the antibodies to attach to that. But like beta and like 
uh, Delta, the vaccines will still work well with something called T-cell responses because T-cell responses prevent severity of infection. They don't prevent you from getting infected, but they prevent you from getting serious disease because what they do is that they go and identify cells that are already infected and they help to kill them. Right, that, that much is, is very interesting. The, the other thing that's coming to the fore versus when we were in the beta phase is that uh, there's a lot of TV programs talking about the younger uh, people uh, getting more infected. I saw some stats doing its rounds about two-year-olds. Uh, what has changed about that or what have you learned in terms of the susceptibility of, say, uh, the youth being more infected now with where we're sitting with the variant? Well, we've seen with the past variants that you know, nobody is protected from this virus. I mean, just across all the different ages. Younger children tend to have lower infection rates, partly because, uh, you know, of the way in which they interact with the population. But adolescents, on the other hand, get infected at pretty high rates. So there's really no protection for any age group. Everybody gets this infection. Fortunately, young people don't get severe illness very commonly. They do get severe illness, but it's rare that that happens. But when you have a situation where millions of young people are going to get infected, even a small number, uh, you know, a small percentage of people, it translates into quite a lot of people having to go to hospitals and already we see that at Baraguana. That Baraguana is already quite busy. And the problem we have in this country is that we have too low a vaccination rate. And now people can't complain that, oh, we don't have vaccines because we do have vaccines. People are just not... So we need to... Uh, we're going to have to make some difficult decisions that, you know, when it becomes difficult and when there are a lot of patients needing care, you know, we're going to need to prioritize that care. And in my view, individuals who chose not to protect themselves, you know, will need to uh, deal with that risk because they are going to be the ones queuing up to try and get into hospitals. Uh, Professor, in, in, in terms of the next aspect, and I, and I want to draw you on this because it, it is not an easy question to answer, but you would have seen in the news about the Rage Festival in Belito and Plettenberg Bay, which the CEO of that organization uh, seemed to have all his uh, ducks in a row, so to speak, in terms of testing and certificates and uh, uh, vaccination cards or digital vaccination certificates uh, yet uh, they, they were put in a position after just a day where they had to cancel the event. And the reason I'm drawing you on this is because we're getting into the festive season. We've all worked 11 months. We've had the stresses of the pandemic and family losing their livelihoods. And, and we want to gather. We want to uh, enjoy the festive season and summer. Uh, so just taking from what has happened there where they uh, purportedly followed all the right processes and procedures, although they found themselves beached, uh, what do you see happening in terms of how we go about preventing ourselves from being infected and how we conduct ourselves over this festive season? Yeah, you're raising an important issue on here because about two or three weeks ago, I was interviewed about uh, the rage in Belito, and I said it should never be allowed to proceed. It should be banned, and the reason for that is very simple. If we don't learn from history, we are doomed to repeat its errors. Last year, when we were facing the beta variant, the Belito rage led to more than a thousand new infections. And not just that it led to those infections, those young people went back to Gauteng and went back to everywhere and they spread the virus. So. You can't allow those kinds of activities because they just, they just take us into a situation of rapid spread because it's a super spreading event. Now, while after learning that last year, 
why are we repeating that problem this year with my argument? Well, I didn't need to make that argument too for success B because they learned it on themselves that even though they ignored my uh, suggestion that it shouldn't proceed, they went ahead and they learned that if you are dealing with uh, an event in the midst of a pandemic and in the midst of a wave, there will be large numbers of people with the virus. They don't know they have it, especially because they're young people. They don't have symptoms, so they don't know they have the virus, but they have it, and they're walking around everywhere. When you put them together, they will spread this virus. So we have to draw on that lesson. And just accept that at this stage, when we are in a wave, we really have to reduce our interactions with others. If we don't do that, the virus is going to spread very rapidly, much more rapidly than otherwise. So what we want to do is we want to minimize our interactions with others. And for those that we do want to interact with, if we're going to interact with them, let's do it outdoors. And if we can't do it outdoors, then if we're going to have indoor functions, everybody must be vaccinated. Because if they're not vaccinated, then they run the risk that they will spread it. Now, just to make one very important point, that vaccines don't only provide an individual benefit. They don't only benefit the person who receives the vaccine. But there are many studies now, for example, there's a study in the New England Journal of Medicine that shows that individuals who have been vaccinated, their risk, if they get infected, their risk of spreading it to their household contacts is much lower than individuals who got infected and are not vaccinated. So vaccinations have a huge benefit that goes beyond the person themselves. It benefits their family members, their household members, their work colleagues, and so on. So for that reason, if you're going to have family gatherings, if you're going to have Christmas lunch, please make sure that it's outdoors, and if it's indoors, please make sure everybody's vaccinated. Well, that's a very, very valid point you make, and I think our listeners can have a big takeaway from that as they're looking to, you know, have a little bit of downtime over this festive season. Uh, in in terms of what you've seen, and I know that you do get about, uh, you know, whether it's a bit of shopping or this and that, but uh, what I've seen is, is just a bit of apathy in terms of those mechanisms outside supermarkets not working, containers having little or no uh, sanitizer, uh, what's your advice uh, for, for those that, of course, will be shopping over this festive season? Yeah, I think the most important thing is going to be our masks. I'm less concerned about sanitizer. The amount of spread that occurs by touching is much, much lower. But when you're dealing with a highly infectious virus like this, even small amounts of the virus in the air can lead to infection. So masks are going to be, uh, you know, our most critical uh, protection. So we need, really need to get out of our complacency because of the low numbers of infections that uh, we have had during, you know, the last few months, uh, we've become complacent. You know, when we see, you know, there's only 200 cases in a day, ah, we don't have to worry, you know, we can drop our guard. Also, it's tiring. I mean, people are frustrated. They're fed up. They're angry. I mean, this virus has been so irritating. And, you know, I share that frustration with you. It's really irritating. And, you know, you, you sort of get a bit depressed with this damn virus because it's not letting you, you know, meet your friends, have your family. It's not letting you do the important things in life that make us human. But, you know, we've just got to stay in there. We've just got to, you know, bide our time. It's, you know, the, the virus is with us. We just need to be careful. We'd rather be safe than sorry. 
Professor, I've spoken to some family out in England and uh, their, their opinion in terms of our infection rates, because I was speaking to them about uh, an average of, say, 40,000 a day. You know, initially we felt a bit hurt that we were put on the UK red list very quickly, so everyone responded to that. Uh, but they, their take is that we should be promoting and subsidizing self testing, uh, which allows people who feel that during the day there might have been an outing or a queue or whatever the case might be uh, to self-test and, and that to be subsidized so it's not that expensive. Uh, have you got an opinion on that? Oh, absolutely. Self-testing is a key part of how we deal with the virus. You know, I, when I was in France a few weeks ago at the Pasteur Institute, Everywhere you go, in all the pharmacies, you get a little box, and there's a rapid test in there. So you can just test yourself whenever you want. And that is a pretty good system. Uh, but the way, uh, you know, the, the cost of that is quite high, those little boxes. So the way we've dealt with it is that we've just made the testing available free. So you can just go anywhere and just get a test. I'm hoping that the companies that are making the self-testing, the home test kits, you know, will come and apply to SAPRA to uh, market their products here because they just haven't come in. I think our market may not be big enough for them. But, you know, we can't get it unless somebody makes an application and gets approval from SAPRA because we can't distribute a test that's not approved. So I think, you know, that's that's what the rate-limiting step is, and that's why we don't have it yet. But the tests themselves are available in the country in bulk, and they're used in various laboratories. And now when you go anywhere and you want a test, they'll just do a rapid test. You have the answer in 10 minutes. Right, yeah, brilliant. Uh, now, Professor, I know that you're quite a tall man, uh, but I saw you on one of the international channels, and they rec reckon that you're the Fauci of South Africa. How did you take to that? Oh, I'm not the anything of anyone else. You know, I, I'm, I'm very simple. I am Salim Abdul Karim. I'm from Durban in South Africa. That's it. I'm not anything else. Right, okay. I thought you'd react that way. But uh, having said that, uh, what did you find, just to kind of conclude, about their line of questioning uh, to you about this Omicron or the situation in South Africa? Did you find anything different in terms of what they were trying to probe you about? No, I think, uh, you know, across the board, uh, CNN, Sky News, BBC, they all want those same three questions answered. They want to know, is it spreading faster? Is it causing more severe disease? And do the vaccines work? And, I mean, you know, we don't have answers to those three questions. We have some tentative information to help give us what might be the answers. And that's what I try to convey to them. There's a lot of uncertainty, but this is what we know. And this is about as good as we can get at this time, realizing that it might change with more information. Oh, absolutely. Now, our final question to you, Professor, and thank you so much for your time, is the prediction is that Gauteng will peak around the 15th or 16th. Uh, just a forecast, because more times than not, you, you kind of write or you hit the nail on the head. Uh, how, how do you see this playing out? You know, bearing in mind that it's just a, a, a kind of forecast in terms of how we behave. But how do you see it playing out? Yeah, I think uh, this is going to play itself out slightly differently, I think. I don't know, but I'm just thinking aloud that I think we're going to go into uh, a double wave here. We'll, we'll go in, uh, because Houting and the Western Cape cases are rising early, we will get to a certain level towards the peak close to uh, Christmas, uh, you know, between 16th and 24th. And then when we close businesses on the 16th, and, you know, most of the companies close around that time and all the big factories close, we will have a huge movement of people. And when that happens, we will see a second uh, spike in the cases. 
because of the movement of people and the fact that they've now gone home to their various places and they've taken the virus with them and are now spreading it in new parts of the country. So I'm expecting that this wave is going to look a bit different, not just the nice, you know, cone that we normally see. Uh, but, you know, we'll see what happens when, the, you know, it comes to January. Well, uh, Professor Salim Abdul Karim, always a pleasure speaking to you for your insights and your thoughts and picking your brain quite literally. Thank you for making the time and uh, uh, safety to you and your family and have a nice festive season. Uh, thank you very much. It's always a pleasure. Yeah. Have a okay. nice day and uh, goodbye to all of the listeners. All right, there you go, Professor Salim Abdul Karim talking to us right here on The Breakfast Express. In this world where your money needs to work smarter for you, wouldn't you rather have a bank that's serious?